All right. Good morning, everybody. It's the wee hours of April 23rd, 2011, and this is my fourth video tutorial. We're sort of exploring N Audio with the C Sharp language. So let's just jump right into it. I'm going to give you a very, very, very quick demo of how we're going to uh, sort of proceed with tutorial 4. And to do that, I'm going to pull up one of my sort of test applications here, and I'm just going to quickly show you what a sine wave looks like. So a sine wave, a 1 kilohertz sine wave in this case, looks something like this. It's uh, right out of your high school textbook. Just a simple sine wave going up and down. This is going up and down 1,000 times per second, and this is one second worth of a sine wave. So there's 44,100 samples of this sine wave. So you can imagine that if I was playing this through my computer speakers, I'd be getting some audio tone coming out. Now as you can see, this is mapped between minus one and plus one. So this is a double precision representation of a sine wave. This is what the math library will give you by default. So very briefly, I'm going to tell you about why this will not work in the case of audio. The reason for that is that the audio that we're dealing with is stored in integer format. So we need to map it to a much larger value. Instead of minus one to plus one, we're actually going to extend it up to around uh, 32,768 down to minus 32,768. Uh, it's actually off by one because that's sine, but whatever. Um, so I'm going to show you what that looks like. I'm going to convert this sine wave to 16-bit. There it is. You can see that instead of being from plus 1 to minus 1, it's actually from plus 32,000 something, 32,768, all the way to minus 32,768. But aside from that, the sine wave looks nearly identical. There's a little bit of rounding that goes on in here to make sure that every single one of these samples is an integer value, but not too bad at all. And the reason I'm showing you this is because in tutorial number four, we're actually going to go and create a custom wave stream class that generates this tone for an, for an audio to play back. So we're going to go through the entire process of making a custom wave stream, and we're going to do it super fast because I can only make 15 minute videos on uh, YouTube. So let's jump right into tutorial number four. And really quickly, I'm going to go and add nAudio as a reference. Browse nAudio.dll. And let's just go and give this guy some basic stuff. Tutorial for. I'm going to take myself out of the picture so you can actually see what I'm typing. And I'm just going to put a button on here really quick. One more button. There we go. Let's move this form a bit. And I'm just going to call this Start Tone, and I'll give this guy a name Stop Tone. So let's jump right into it. We're going to have Start Tone, Stop Tone, move some of this, and we're going to use nAudio.wave to save ourselves some typing. All right, so we're going to have to have a custom wave stream object. I'm going to do that down here by making a new class called Wave Tone, and it's going to inherit from Wave Stream. Now you can remember the wave stream is what we need to pass to our direct sound out so that it can play, play something. Anyways, So right away if you hit compile you're going to notice that wave tone is not working, it's not compiling, oh get out of here, because it needs to implement these methods and these accessors. So let's do that really quick. We'll see that we need to be able to override this position value. So position, get, and set. Now our sine wave doesn't really have a position. This isn't a file that we're reading through. We've got an infinitely long tone that we're generating. Well, theoretically infinitely long. So really, I'm just going to have some get and set methods on here. And they're not going to do anything because there's no reason to set the position in my sine wave. Now the other, th other one we need to do is this length method. Well, since our sine wave is potentially infinitely long, we'll just return long.max value. That way, an audio isn't going to stop it anytime soon. Sorry, that needs return. All right, what else do we need to do? We needed to return the wave format. And we're just going to return a very standard wave format. We're going to return 44,100 samples per second, 16 bits per sample, and a single channel. So that's what we're going to be generating. Our sine wave will be 16 bits 
44,000 learned samples per second, and it's going to be a single channel. And the last one we need to override is the read method. So this is going to be a bit of work. We need some more information before we can implement this. So right now, I'm just going to return count. Count is the number of bytes to read. It expects the number of bytes read to be returned. So we're just going to return count for now. And now I'm going to go and start to fill up this Wavetone class. So there are three things that a Wavetone needs to work properly. One of them is going to be the frequency of the tone. So that would be something like 1 kilohertz for a sort of normal tone, 3 kilohertz for a pretty high frequency tone, that would get pretty annoying, and then 100 hertz or something would be sort of your base frequencies. Then we're going to need an amplitude, which is going to be how big our sine wave is. So uh, if you set an amplitude of 1, it would go between 1 and minus 1. If you set an amplitude of 0.1, it would go from 0.1 to minus 0.1. You get the idea. And the last one is going to be the time that we're at. So you can imagine that as time increases, our sine wave is moving up and down. So we need to keep track of time. Now let's make our constructor. We're going to want to take a frequency in. So I'm going to say double F for frequency, double A for amplitude, just to save myself some typing. And I'm going to set time to zero to start with because we're starting with no time. Frequency is F, amplitude is A. That's everything we need. Now let's jump into this read method. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look to see what's required of this read method. So it returns an integer, it's given a buffer, an offset, and count. So count is the number of bytes that N audio is requesting. Offset is the offset from wherever it is in the position in the stream. This will normally be zero. And the buffer is actually the the byte array that we're going to write to. So that's what N audio will read. So when it gives this byte buffer to us, or this byte array to us, it's going to be empty. It's just going to have a bunch of zeros in it. We're going to fill that up with data, and then N audio is going to play that. So the first thing I'm going to do is calculate the number of samples that I need to calculate. So this is going to be count divided by two. This is pretty easy because count is requiring the number of bytes. It's two bytes per samples. Remember, 16 bits is two bytes. So we're going to have count divided by two samples. Now we want to loop over every sample, and we're going to calculate a sine value. So the sine value is going to be the amplitude multiplied by math.sine. And now sine is in radians, so we're going to have to convert to or we're going to have to convert our frequency to radians and we'll multiply that by time. So this is going to generate our sine wave and now we need to move our time value by 1 divided by the sample rate which is 44,100. So if 44,100 samples are requested we're going to move one second in time over the period of our samples here. Now what we need to do is we need to convert this double precision value to a fixed point integer value that's 16 bits. So we're going to do that by multiplying it by 2 to the power of 15 and truncating it. So let's create a variable called truncated. And we'll use math.round. We'll multiply our sine value by, get this right, 2 to the power of 15 minus 1. The reason for this is that uh, it's signed arithmetic. So a signed value for 16 bits actually goes between 2 to the power of 15 minus 1 at the top all the way down to 2 to the power of 15 or negative 2 to the power of 15 for the lower scale. So I'm just going to multiply by 2 to the power of 15 minus 1 so I avoid any sort of overflows or anything nasty like that. So this is that conversion from floating point to integer, 16 bits. So now we'll go and fill up that buffer. So we're going to fill up our buffer the first byte is going to be a truncated short value. And the short value there is two bytes, so we're just going to take the first byte to start with. This is just some uh, bit arithmetic to get that first byte. And we're going to set the next byte of our buffer to the second byte of truncated. So again, this is just some bit arithmetic to get that second byte. This is the second byte shifted down by one byte so that it appears to only be a single byte, put it into our buffer. That's everything we need to do for wave tone. If we compile, you'll see that we're not getting any errors now. We're implementing every method that we need to. 
So now let's jump in and just quickly write out this code because I'm probably getting close to my 15 minute time limit. So we're going to have a direct sound out. And I'm going to use a block align reduction stream because it's nice and easy. Now we're going to have to create a wave tone. And I'm going to put a thousand kilohertz in here. Type tone. So Sorry, I'm going to put a thousand hertz in there, which is one kilohertz, and I'm going to give it a pretty low amplitude because tones are very, very loud. They're very high power. And I'm going to use that tone as my wave stream for this block line reduction stream. I'm going to create my new direct sound output as before, and I'm going to initialize it with that block line reduction stream, and then I'm going to play it. Now all that's left to do is implement stop tone here. So if my output is not null, then I'm going to stop it. Excellent. So the last thing I should do is I really should clean up my resources properly. So when the form is closing, I'm just really quickly going to copy and paste an old method that we have there. So if the output is not null, dispose it. If the stream is not null, dispose it. We're cleaning everything up. Let's give this a try. We're going to compile, run our code, and start our tone. So that's what a 1 kilohertz tone sounds like. You can see N Audio is going and requesting that we build up that sort of buffer of that sine wave, and it's progressing through and generating a 1 kilohertz tone. Let's listen to see what 100 hertz sounds like. This is more around your bass frequencies. So you can barely hear that. If you have a subwoofer, it's probably kicking in. And then we're going to toss 3 kilohertz in there, 3,000 hertz. Oh, that's, that's annoying. <laughs> So we're just not going to play that for very long. There you go. A lot to learn this lesson. You can see how this buffer is filled up, how, how computers really deal with audio, uh, how to truncate and uh, move a double precision number up to 16 bits. So as always, all the tutorials are available on giawa.com, G-I-A-W-A.com slash tutorials. The source code's posted, the videos are posted, I'll answer any questions you might have, and I'm going to bid you adieu because I am sure that I'm probably over my 15 minute time limit, or at least getting close. So have a great night, always have fun coding, and I'll see you in the next video tutorial where we'll start to create more custom wave streams. We can do uh, Maybe we'll do, uh, let's start on an effect stream, that's what we'll do, yes. So tutorial number five, we're going to start to build up a custom wave stream, which is an effect stream, and we're going to be able to add some cool effects like echo and reverb, things like that in the future. I look forward to doing those tutorials, and I hope you have a great evening.